Dear Akoti, my sister, welcome to another video. This is actually going to be a video kind of starting a slightly different series still having to do with womanhood, but more in the line of spiritual womanhood. So how we can as women become more spiritual, really walking in with our spirit leading the way, um, obviously being influenced by the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh and how we can begin to live that way so that we can really begin to observe Yas Torah and really just live out that life that we're craving to live as followers of the way or as Nazarenes, whatever you want to call yourself. Um, so before we begin, as always, there is a Facebook group for the Dear Koti channel that you can join. The link is in the description box and I definitely highly recommend that you join. It is becoming such a awesome place for us to be able to really discuss topics that matter. Um, things that if I was to post on Facebook, people would could care less about, to be honest. Um, but now I actually have women that I can talk about these topics with, things like womanhood, submission, um, the end times and things, you know, how we can prepare ourselves and even just following the Torah and learning things about the Torah, you know, can women wear pants, should they not, you know, different things that are in Torah that people kind of discuss. I actually have other women that we can like discuss it with. So it's pretty awesome. Link in the description. Um, and yeah, that's that. Um, as always, also, I always have my notes. So if I'm ever looking down, it's for that reason. Um, so I can try to stay on topic as best as I can. And then also for the names. So anytime I refer to um, our Father, our God, our Creator, I will call him by his name, Yahuwah, and that is how I personally pronounce it so that you always know who I'm referring to. And then for the Messiah, I typically refer to him either as his title of Messiah or I'll call him by his Hebrew name, Yahusha, which again, I know people pronounce differently depending on what you've learned, but that's how I personally pronounce it. So with all of that out of the way, um, let's go ahead and dive in. So let's talk first why spiritual womanhood. So Yah created us women to be intuitive beings. This is something that we learned in Womanhood 101, um, which I have all of the blog posts available on the Dear Koti site. So I'll be sure to remember, try to remember at least to put the link to all of those posts below where you can really peruse and learn about womanhood. Um, so we've been created to be intuitional beings. But in order to truly be in tune with Yah's will so that we can then counsel our men, raise our children, and walk the right path ourselves, we have to live our lives spiritually. And in order to know what we need to know, and in order to do that, we need to know what our spirit actually is and how it functions. Hence, spiritual womanhood. So, this is going to be our strong base, our foundation. And, um, Womanhood 101, we really learned why we were created. And again, I'm, I'm referencing that because I don't really want to have to make new videos on it um, because I already have the auto, audio downloads. And actually, this video itself has an audio download. It is a, this, this information I'm going to share with you is literally a post I did for Faith 101, which was a course I had started um, to teach after Womanhood 101, but I had taken a slight hiatus, so I'm kind of restarting it because I hadn't finished it. So I'm restarting it on the YouTube channel, so I'm going to, the first few videos are going to sound familiar if you did take Faith 101, because we're going to be going through the same exact information. Um, but the last course that I had did, which was Womanhood 101, we learned about why we were created and what we are to do on this earth as women. So now we're actually going to learn the how. How do we begin to actually walk spiritually so that we can play our part and play our role? So welcome to Spiritual Womanhood. I am so happy to have you here. And most importantly, I thank Yah, the Most High, our Creator, that we can even be gathered on this YouTube channel. I don't know how much longer we'll have before, you know, stuff hits the fan and we no longer have access to YouTube. But I'm happy that we're here now and that we can discuss these things and that we can continue to learn together. This information, like I said, can also be found on the blog where you'll find the free downloadable audio along with a written blog post. Um, and so you can choose to download it and listen to it, you know, whenever you want. Uh, if you're somebody who prefers to listen to more like podcasty type things. And also just remember to stay open minded and be willing to hear something different that you may not have heard before. And I really want to hone in on that really quickly. So the truth is given to set us free, not to find fault, not to really kind of burden us. And I say this because in Womanhood 101 and with anything that I've ever shared on YouTube or on the blog, I may share things that rub you the wrong way or that kind of convict you or that 
just kind of you, make you in your mind go, hmm, I don't know about that, or I've never heard that before, if that's different. And oftentimes it's when you hear the truth, you experience something called cognitive dissonance, which is actually a topic we covered um, live in the Facebook group. So um, that video is still there in the Facebook group if you want to go ahead and go ahead go ahead and go ahead, go ahead and watch that. And my air conditioning just came on. I am in Texas and it is hot outside. So if you hear that in the background, I apologize. Um, but I'm not here to offend you. I'm not here to rub you the wrong way. I'm here to tell you to be open-minded to Yah's truth and to test everything against the word. Um, so that's how I take everything in myself. Anytime um, I experience cognitive dissonance, which is literally your brain something new coming into your brain and your brain is not willing to accept it because it's going against what it already believes and has hold, held as truth. So anytime I experience that, I test everything anyways in general against the word, but when something really kind of like irks me, I look into it even deeper to see why is this bothering me? Is this a truth that I need to discover or X, Y, and Z? So just adding that in before we begin. So let's go ahead. There's three parts to us, and most of us in our modern times think that it's body, mind, and soul. And that's the answer that I had pretty much my entire life up until I started really learning and diving in and realizing that, that those weren't the three parts. <laughs> so the real answer is that we have a spirit, a soul, and a body. So we can see proof of this in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, which says, um, And the Elohim of peace himself set you completely apart and your entire spirit and being or soul because your being is your soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our master Yahusha the Messiah and just so you know for this video I will be reading from the scriptures um, translation which you can access through the Bible app you can access um, through the eSword app many different apps you can access that translation through so I know that you're probably thinking body soul and mind or mind, mind and soul, or body, soul, and well, hold on. I'm getting myself confused here. Okay, so you're probably thinking that, you know, body, mind, and soul is the same thing as spirit, soul, and body, that they're pretty much similar and that the terms don't really matter. But it does matter. Everything matters in the Bible. Everything matters in Yah's Word. There's a reason why you, that why you see in the um, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 why it's written saying your entire spirit being or soul and body it is distinguishing three separate parts and there's a reason for that it's because each part is important and has its own role so it's super important that we distinguish the differences between these three parts especially the soul and spirit which oftentimes is probably the most mixed up words and terms as far as the three parts go a lot of people tend to think that your soul and your spirit are the same thing and they're not so we tend to use spirit and soul so interchangeably that we begin to see them as the same. Hence our answer typically being body, mind, and soul. If we are to walk spiritually, this means that we actually need to understand what our spirit is and how it functions. We also need to know how our other two parts function as well because they all have to remain in balance. Um, and also so that we can also, you know, just know which one we're functioning in. Oh, I'm not in spirit right now. I'm functioning out of my soul. Let me go back to spirit kind of thing. Um, so this is important for our spiritual growth as women. Cannot stress it enough. Separating the soul and spirit and discerning between all of the parts in general is very, very, very necessary. So he, reading Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of Elohim, and if you um, aren't familiar with the term Elohim, Elohim is uh, the Hebrew word meaning God. Um, goes a little bit deeper, but we'll keep it basic. So, for the word of Elohim is living and working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of being or soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So, you have to note the importance here in this verse of the division of soul and spirit. It matters. That's the point I'm trying to make here. So we've got it. There's three parts. But how are they different? Why does it matter? What do these things have to do with our spirituality? Well, let me tell you, Akoti, my sister. This is exactly what we're going to be talking about in the whole little spiritual womanhood course. We're really going to be discerning between all three parts, how they function, how you know which part you're functioning out of, and how to begin to function out of your spirit. Um, so really, really excited to dive into this this course or this course. Eh, 
general course this series on the channel okay um, so let's talk about creation of mankind this is something we did talk about in womanhood 101 but we talked about it having to really deal with the difference between the creation of man and woman so this time we're really going to look at how humankind was created in general you know so how Adam really was created so that we can see the three distinct parts um, so we're going to be reading from Genesis 2 7 and we're going to read it in two translations the scriptures and then we're going to read it in the mechanical translation of Genesis by Jeff Banner um, and there's actually a free PDF downloadable copy of that on the resources page and the link for the resources page for the Dear Koti site is down below um, and it's always there in every video. Um, so reading Genesis 2 7 in the scriptures says and Yahuwah Elohim formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils breath of lives. Make a note on lives there, okay? And the man became a living being. And then we're going to read it in the mechanical translation, which says, And Yahuwah, or he exists, of Elohim, or powers, molded the human of powder from the ground, and he exhaled in his nostrils a breath of life, and the human existed for a being of life. Really, really awesome reading that mechanical translation. It's really, it's only for the book of Genesis, but it really like word for word translated the Hebrew. Really awesome to read. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the words in here. The first word we're going to look at is dust. So the Hebrew word for this is afar, which is H6083 in the Strong's Concordance, and it means clay, earth, mud, or dust. Here you can clearly see that it's the body the one part of us, one part out of the three that's being made. Moving on, you'll see the next group of words is breathed or nostrils or breath and life. The word breathed in the Hebrew is nafak, meaning um, to blow. And then you have the word nostrils in Hebrew, which is af, which means nose, nostrils, or holes for breathing. And then you have the breath in Hebrew, which is nashima or um, H5397, and it means breath pant or wind and it represents the spirit which is um really really interesting and then lastly you have the word life in the hebrew which is the word hai and it's c-h-a-y and it means literally the stomach and interestingly enough the definition reads literally as this and this definition i found in um another downloadable pdf it's the ancient hebrew lexicon by jeff banner that pdf download is also available on the resources page so you can um, take a look at that as well it's really really awesome to use i also have a video that shows you how i use it um, and that's a video that is called i think it's like how i bible study or how i study the bible i'll try to remember to link that one too um so it says literally the organ that holds food but is figurative for life when the stomach is empty, one is famished and weak, and when it is filled, one is revived. An empty stomach means death, while a revived stomach means life. So I found this really, really interesting, especially seeing that one of our favorite modern phrases is, I have a gut feeling. It's funny how our gut or stomach tends to deal with our intuition, which, huge hint here, is part of our spirit. So here is, in this part of the verse, we see man's spirit being created. So God blew his breath into man, creating the spirit of man. And as a side note, I want to mention that this does not mean that we have Yah's spirit. Um, we have a human spirit which can interact with Yah's spirit. And so that's something we'll talk about a little later on. Um, moving on to the last groups of words, we have became, living, and being. So the word became in the Hebrew is haya, so it's spelled just like hai, it's C-H-A-Y and then an A at the end. And this is all in English, I'm not going to spell it in Hebrew right now. Um, but it means to exist or to have breath, and it's defined as the character of someone or something. Very, very interesting. So keep that in mind. The next word, living, in the Hebrew is again hai and means revival of life from food or other necessity. Um, and it's pretty interesting also because you see in John 6, 63 that we're told the Spirit gives us life. So keeping all these things in mind, the word being in Hebrew is nefesh, and it means soul or to refresh the whole of a person, um, body, breath, bre body, breath or spirit, and mind or soul. It also means a breathing creature or animal. So this last group of words shows us the last part of the being created, which was the soul. So as soon as the breath of life, which becomes man's spirit, interacts with 
the body or comes in contact with the body, the soul is created as a result. Really, really awesome. And it just shows you how deep just a couple, one verse itself can go in the Bible. So never overlook a verse. Always do a deep study when you can. Um, so it's really amazing. So what's even more interesting is that when you go back to the scriptures translation of Genesis 2-7, when reading it, remember I told you to take note of when it said, and God breathed the breath of lives, right? And so in this part of the scripture, the word for life or hi is written in plural. And it's funny because you have a scripture telling us that multiple lives were created. And then you learn that the, both the soul and the spirit were created, which are two different lives in that one breath. So it's just really, really, really awesome to read. And I just, when I realized that, when I learned that, I was just like, hold on a minute. What? So, um... Completely mind blown there. So here's where we are. We've learned that the breath of God entered the body. It became the spirit of man. Then we also learned that the spirit reacted with the body, creating the soul. So now we've got our body, which is the dust of the ground. We've got our spirit, which is the breath of life. And then we've got our soul, which was the result of these two things interacting with each other. And it's in the soul where these two parts meet. Together they create our character, um, each unique and individual to each person. A good example that I found was that um, when you mix dye and water, so you have two completely separate entities. You have dye and you have water. And when you mix the two, you get ink, which is a third entity. And so it's super, super similar to how you have body and spirit coming together, creating soul. Um, so your soul represents you and it expresses your individuality. It's your character and your free will. Your soul is what makes you different from the rest of creation. Angels are spirits, while animals tend to just be more fleshly beings. And so we as humans are made special. Uh, and then looking at an even better example, you can take a light bulb, right? So you, in it you have, you have electricity, you have wire, and you have light. So the electricity is your spirit, your soul is the light, and your body is the wire. And so the wire is the actual material substance that's needed to carry the current of electricity, which then creates the light that you see in the bulb. These exam I, I can go on for days, but it's just like these two examples were really, 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 really awesome examples. So anyways, we're going to say it one more time again. We have three distinct parts, spirit, soul, body. And the only reason why I'm continuing to repeat this is because I want us to get it in our minds. I want us to get this whole body, mind, and soul idea out of our head because that's not what we have. Technically, yes, but that's not the full truth. The full truth is spirit, soul, and body. So let's dive a little bit deeper, yes? Awesome. So let's talk first about how each of these parts are different. So we're going to talk about the body first. So our body is what gives us contact with the material world. We receive our world consciousness through this, this material substance that we have, through this flesh. Um, the soul is our intellect, our will, and our emotions, or our personality. It gives us awareness of our self or the self-consciousness. And then the spirit is the part we use to build a relationship with Yah. It gives us our Yah consciousness, consciousness. And this does not mean God consciousness as in how people in the New Age kind of talk. It's not like that. We're not Yah and can never know and understand all that he knows. We can know of him, but we are not him. So Yah dwells in, our sp in the spirit, um, Swelf dwells, dwells in the soul, and our senses dwell in our body. Three distinct things, three distinct parts. So, the spirit interacts with the spiritual realm, receiving and expressing the power and life of the spiritual realm. The body gives us contact, again, with the outside world, allowing us to either be affected by it or to affect it. Our soul, which is the meaning point of the two, um, stands between both worlds and yet stands between two worlds and yet belongs to both of them. It has a completely free will, so it's able to choose which environment it wants to live in. It's the medium, or the middleman, if you will, between the body and the spirit. The spirit can either lead the body through the soul, or the body can lead the spirit through the soul, or the soul can actually decide to just do its own thing and rule over everything. So of the three parts, your spirit is by far the most noble because it connects you directly to Yah. Your body, because it connects you to the world, is considered the lowest. And your soul joins the two together and keeps them in order. We're going to talk more on that in a little bit. So since the spirit is the most noblest part, 
it occupies the innermost part of our being. The body being the lowest occupies the outer part and then the soul is the one that's in the middle in between and kind of is like a shell to the spirit and is within the flesh. So the soul is powerful because it's a merging place. It determines how you ultimately live your life because again, you have free will. It's the seed of your personality, it includes your will, intellect, and emotions, has the power to decide which world you're going to allow to reign, and can even choose to create its own world. This truly defines your free will. Otherwise, you become a robot. So remember, well, if you took Womanhood 101, back in Womanhood 101, um, we studied the word bana, and more specifically the letter B or the bet in the um, Hebrew al Aleph bet. And so we're going to look at that letter bet again or B. So we came to the conclusion in that course that our body was built like a temple among other things. And so this still definitely holds true, even reflecting our three parts. So 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are a dwelling place of Elohim and that the spirit of Elohim dwells in you? So let's take a look at a few words in here. So first word really, or two words is dwelling place. And so we're gonna look at it both from the Greek and the Hebrew. So a little fact, I'm not even gonna cover that because it doesn't matter. Let's move on. I'm reading from my notes, which is literally the direct blog post. So trying to touch on things here and there. Okay, so in the Greek, you see the word neos, which means to dwell or a temple, and then the Hebrew word is mishkan, and it means a place of residence. Diving deeper into the Hebrew root, we find the verb shakan, and in, um, in the Strong's Concordance, that verb is going to be H7931, and it means to stay or sit in one location. So looking at the word spirit, in the Greek, it's pneuma, and means holy spirit, air, wind, or breeze. In the Hebrew, we know that this word is ruach, and it means wind of man or Yahuwah or the prescribed path. And funny enough, Hebrew nomads would actually follow the wind patterns, creating a prescribed path for themselves to travel during the seasons. So that's something to make note of. It's going to make sense, I promise. So lastly, looking at the word dwelleth or dwells, in the Greek this word is oikio and means to occupy a house, reside, or cohabit. In the Hebrew, the word is yeshab, and means to set oneself down in the dwelling place for a night or a long period to settle or remain in a place to be returned to. So we look at these words for a reason. Paul called our body a dwelling place of Yah, meaning a temple. Yah's spirit dwells in our temple. And like the temple, we have three parts. So let's look at the temple first. So you have the outer court, which is seen and visited by all. This is where external worship is offered. Then you have the holy place. And this is... Um, the place where only priests can enter, the place where they present oil, incense, and bread to Yah. They're able to be near him, but not directly in his presence. Then you have the third place, which is the Holy of Holies. This is the place where Yah actually dwells. There is no light needed because his spirit shines so bright. No one can enter this place except for once a year when a high priest goes to atone for the sins of the nation. And even then, he has to be extremely clean to be able to enter in. This place is protected by a veil, a veil that we know Yah himself tore when the Messiah died on the stake. So with that tearing of the veil, our bodies became the temple um, of Yah instead of the physical building. And so this is Yah doing his part to put things back into divine order. So like the temple, our body has three parts. The outer court is our body. It is the external part that everybody can see. Our life is visible to everyone. Then you have the holy place, which is our soul. This is the place where our inner life, our intentions, um, and our will are. Then you have the holy of holies or the spirit. This is where no man can go. This is the place where the most high dwells within us. And this is the place where we are able to commune with him. So all of this that we just learned only works the way it was intended to if we follow Yah's divine order. So just like he has a divine order for relationships, it goes Yah, man, woman, children. It's the same thing with the body. It's spirit, soul, then body. He has a divine order for everything. So we see this again, you see it written in a specific order, looking back at the Thessalonians 5.23 where we read spirit, soul, and body. There's a reason. Everything in the Bible is written in a specific order for a reason. Everything, um, it reminds me of the word debar in the Hebrew, meaning everything in its orderly place. Um, 
also the word or the plan. So you have to realize that everything in the Bible is written in a specific order. And so this is something that I really, really want to stress to you. So it's written in spirit, spirit, soul, and body for a reason because that is Yah's divine order. Your body is a temple and everything should follow Yah's spirit. Your spirit should commune with His receiving direction. It should then pass that direction on to your soul who then gives the order to the body to follow. That is Yah's divine order. Before the fall of man, which we're going to talk about in the next video, we naturally follow this order. But now that we've fallen, we've got to put the effort in to get things back into that order. And it's our choice, of course, with free will. Yah's order never changed. We changed it. We went and took the action to uh, take our free will and to do what we wanted. So why stress the importance of the three parts? Well, for one, we as women are called to be spiritually in tune. But how can we get in tune with our spirit if we don't know what it is or what it does? We need to have a very, very clear cut and dry understanding of the three parts so that we know where our thoughts, feelings, and ideas and actions are coming from. Then we can be sure of whether or not we're functioning in our spirit or not. So now we're going to briefly go over each part alone. More specifically, we're going to talk about the soul and the spirit. The body is pretty self-explanatory, so we won't dive too deep into that until another video. Um, but right now, we're going to focus, like I said, on the spirit and the soul. So our spirit, like us, has three parts. A conscience, intuition, and communion. The conscience is the part that, is, that distinguishes between right and wrong. It does not go by our brain's knowledge, but by a spontaneous judgment, a direct knowing. It doesn't bend to our outside opinions, and it will let you know when you've done something wrong. Oh, my husband's home. Hey, babe. I'm filming a video, just so you know. I appreciate your assistance in this matter, sir. <laughs> okay, so... Like I said, it's a direct knowing. It doesn't bend to outside opinions and it lets you know when you've done something wrong. And so we've all had this feeling of conviction when we immediately knew that we did something that we shouldn't have been doing. So as a side note, your spirit does not equal your conscience. Your conscience is just a function of the spirit. So there's a difference. Your spirit is your spirit and it has different functions or different aspects of it. So your conscience is one of them. Um, so we're going to go ahead and I'm going to just go ahead and list some scriptures. This can be found in the blog post, so I'm not going to read through all of them. Um, but we're going to go through some scriptures that really support you having a function of a conscience as part of your spirit. So Deuteronomy 2.30, Psalms 34.18, Psalms 51.10, John 13.21, Acts 17.16, Romans 8.16, 1 Corinthians 3, the list goes on. Um, so now we're going to look at intuition. Intuition is another function um, of our spirit and it's a sensing function and so it's not like our body or our soul. It comes again as a direct sensing that comes without any outside help, knowledge, emotion, or will. So we really know things with our intuition while we understand with our mind or soul. So our intuition is how we come to know and understand Yah's will for us along with his revelations or teachings. So this is typically when you just know you have to do something. You know Yah's telling you to take action and move in a certain way. You know Yah's moving you to do X, Y, Z. This is your intuition, which again is a second function of your spirit. And again, I have verses and I'm just, I'm not even going to read through them. I have verses to support this in the blog post, which I will link down below the specific post. And then we also have communion, which is the third part of our spirit's function. So this is how we actually communicate or worship, yeah. And so one thing that I grew up believing is that if I lifted my hands during praise and worship, I was worshiping God. And I actually learned that that's not exactly 100% true. Yah asked us to worship him in spirit and in truth. We have to remember that Yah is a spiritual being. He's not a physical, tangible being that you can touch. So in order to communicate with him, we must do so through our spirit, not our soul or our body. Though, yes, we can raise our hands and we can bow and we can, you know, do all these things. But it's important that we worship him in spirit. So um, also, like I said, again, I will refer to the link below 
um, for you to be able to have more scriptures on the, the function of communion. But you have Luke 47, John 4, 23, Romans 1, 9. The list goes on. Again, it's in the description box below. So these three parts work together. Our conscience judges according to intuition. It condemns all conduct which doesn't follow the directions given by intuition. Our intuition is related to communion and worship in that Yah is known to man intuitively and reveals his will in our intuition. So no amount of brain power can give us this knowledge of Yah. That's something that comes straight from our spirit, which is separate from our brain. So now there, of course, are main, main there are more functions of the spirit, but those were the three major ones. Um, and I also want to just quickly make a note. Just because somebody's sensitive to any of these functions does not mean that they're walking spiritually according to Yahuwah. There are other powers in this world. There are other spiritual powers in this world that are not of Yah. And so you can be just as in tune with them as you can be with Yah. And those functions, like I said, are literally just functions. The spirit works regardless of who it's working for. So you have to make sure you know who you're working for. Um, so your spirit's not your mind or your will or your emotions. It's the function of conscience, communion, and intuition. Your spirit is where you truly receive Yah's rest and recharging. This is where you're taught by him and you're led by him. It's not through your soul. Speaking of which, we're going to now touch on the soul. So the soul is our self-consciousness or awareness. We're made conscious of the work we put out with our soul. So it's our personality and it's comprised of the elements that actually make us human. Things like our intellect, our thoughts, our ideas, our love, the ideals we have, our emotion, discernment, our choices, and our decisions. It's the merging place of our spirit and body. And it, like everything else, has three parts. The will, the mind, and the emotions. So the will is our decisions and our power to choose. It shows whether we're willing or unwilling to do something. And like I said earlier, without it, we become robotic. And then... Um, Again, I have scripture to support that below in that link, so go ahead and click that so that you can check out the scriptures for that. Um, and then we have that our mind is our thoughts and our intellectual power. So out of it, we gain wisdom, knowledge, and reasoning. Without it, we're dull. And so we're going to really connect how the soul and the spirit works together at the end. I promise it'll all make sense. And then we also have our emotions, which are our likes, our dislikes, and how we express ourselves. It's all of the emotions that we experience, everything from sadness to joy to anger to happiness, everything. And without it, we literally become insensitive. So our soul is our life. It is our natural life and how we live. It's that which animates us. It's the life we inherit from birth. And we're going to talk more about that in the next video. And we have to be able to distinguish between it and our spirit. So with that, my sister, I ask that you keep seeking Yah. Definitely click that, click that link below and check out those scriptures so that you can test the spirits yourself. I didn't want to take extra time and go and read through everyone because we'd literally be here all day. Um, but I wanted to just be able to give you a basic understanding. We have three parts. We have a spirit, a soul, and a body. And those are our three parts and they each have their own functions. And there's a divine order to them. Our spirit should be in charge of our soul and then our soul giving the orders to our body to carry out the action. And so with that, my sister, I pray that you continue to seek Yah. I pray that you continue to seek his truth and that you continue to test everything against his word. Don't take anything that I say as 100% fact or truth because I'm human. I can be wrong. I definitely have been mistaken many times and I correct myself when I am mistaken. So definitely look into everything. All of the verses, like I said, the link will be below to this specific blog post. I'm really excited to start diving into spiritual womanhood with you um, as we dive into feminine womanhood and you know, as we're diving into our faith foundations. I'm really excited to be able to talk about all of these different areas of our life so that we can really begin to walk as spiritual women who teach the truth of Yah to our families, to our children, to our husbands, and that we ourselves walk spiritually and that we're prepared for what's to come. So with that, I'll see you in the next video. Shalom, shalom.